we are excited to present the rocket Stetin, developed by Propulse NTNU. Propulse NTNU is a volunteer-based student organization from Norway whose goal is to provide students knowledge and enhanced engineering abilities through the development of standing rockets. The project Stetin is the current main project of Propulse Centennial. The objective is to develop a rocket capable of carrying a 4 kilogram payload to a target apogee of 30,000 feet with a Kutz motor. The motor we have chosen is a Pro 98 Ciceroni motor. In this video, we'll present the flight trajectory and the subsystems of the rocket. First up, we have Cecilia presenting the flight trajectory. Simulated in open rocket, the flight profile gives an estimate to the trajectory of the rocket from each phase from liftoff to landing. When all systems are go, the igniter goes off and the rocket motor burns for around six seconds. At this point, the rocket has a speed of around 1.73 Mach and max thrust being 4,100 newtons and peak acceleration at 15 G. Around 40 seconds post-ignition, the rocket has reached apogee. The coasting continues until 9,700 meters, at which point the couplers separate, the drogue shoe releases, and the rocket starts to descend. This event occurs after 100 seconds. A slow descent then follows, and at 340 seconds after launch, or around 460 meters above ground, the main shoe releases to prepare for landing. As mentioned earlier, few seconds pass before the rocket reaches its max velocity. After the, this point, it rapidly decreases and halts at 43 seconds right after reaching apogee. From this point onwards, the velocity remains constant until the main chute releases, increasing only very slightly. The acceleration has a staggering value of the start of launch at circa 130 meters per second squared. The acceleration then quickly declines after the motor stops burning. It then gradually increases, but only very slightly. There is a rapid change in acceleration when the main chute is deployed, but this subsides very quickly. And the acceleration continues at the same pace for the rest of the flight. And now on to Ask, who's going to talk about the aerodynamics. Thank you, Cecilia. Now, the body of Stetson is made to reach a high apogee, uh, while still maintaining structural integrity. So the drag force slowing the rocket down is proportional to the frontal area of the rocket. So therefore, we reduce the diameter as much as possible, essentially making a minimum diameter rocket bounded by the size of the CO2 mechanism inside. For our Hawk series nose cone, simple simulations show that a pretty long nose cone was desirable to reduce drag. And so we made it as long as possible uh, without Trost manufacturing method. In order to achieve an excellent strength to weight ratio for our airframe, uh, we decided to make it out of fiber reinforced polymer. Uh, we wanted the design to be simple without too many different parts. Filament winding fulfilled all these criteria. Essentially, you wind a long strand of pre impregnated carbon or glass fiber around a mandrel, which we have manufactured out of aluminium. Integrating the nose cone shape into the mandrel allows us to make the airframe out of only two parts, the forward and the aft airframe. And interestingly, since we can use the same mandrel twice, uh, we were able to make the Hawk series shape for the aft end of the rocket uh, also. This smooth transition is reducing drag even further. Now at the aft end, we have integrated four trapezoidal fins. Uh, these fins ensure the stability of the rocket essentially moving the central pressure for the rocket downwards. The trapezoidal shape was chosen because it is fairly aerodynamic, but also because it keeps the fins away uh, when we hit the ground and our main parachute. So to reduce the drag even further, there is a wedge angle on the fin leading and trailing edges. We have also investigated the behavior of the rocket using computational fluid dynamics, where we have derived estimates for the coefficients of drag and the center of pressure. At the tip of the nose, we observe an oblique shock wave uh, for the supersonic part phase of the flight, um, as well as Prantlmeyer expansion fans around the transition between the curved and the straight part of the forward airframe. And at the fin's leading edge, and at the transition from the straight to the curved part of the aft airframe. Uh, we can also observe the separation point at the nose and the boundary layer growing along the length of the rocket. 
Uh, it's nice to see these phenomena uh, in fluid mechanics actually show up in the simulation, as it gives the simulation some validity. Now over to Anna, who is going to talk about the avionics and the camera system. Thank you, Ask. Now over to the avionics system. The avionics is designed to perform two main functions, uh, the main function being to activate the recovery system, and the secondary function is to safely store and transmit sensor data and display this live on the ground station. Um, the Astrad flight computer that we have developed uh, consists of two custom PCBs. Uh, first, there's a sensor board that collects data from three barometers, three IMUs, and one GPS, and then uses a common filter to suppress noise in the barometer data. Then there is the main board, which is placed underneath the payload and uses data in a finite state machine to keep track of the rocket's flight trajectory. This way, the microcontroller can send a pulse width modulated signal to the servo motors responsible for releasing the drug and the main chute at the optimal times. Uh, the main board is also collecting temperature and pressure data from the recovery system in order to monitor its state uh, and letting us know whether the COTS or the SRAD flight computer successfully activated the recovery system, and also which of the two Hawks actually pressurized recovery bay. Throughout the whole design process of the avionics system, we have kept in mind to make it as reliable as possible, thereby having the triple redundancy in the IMU and barometer data, in addition to storing all sensor data in multiple places. Uh, this being the two SD cards connected to the sensor board, uh, one of which is inside of a black box, and then also transmitting all this down to ground station via a 5 GHz radio transmitter. And down there, the sensor data and video is displayed and stored locally. And this way, even if the rocket crashes and the black box or somehow the whole rocket is lost, we should still have enough data from the flight to analyze and figure out what went wrong. Now for the cameras. Uh, there are three cameras on the rocket which are recording the flight from different angles. Two of these are pointing outward and the third is in recover bay to monitor the parachute deployments. Both the drogue chute at Apogee and then the main chute later on. One of the cameras pointing outward records a nice 4K video of the horizon, whilst the other has the main purpose of capturing the fins of the rocket. This camera lens has a 185 degree field of view, which allows it to only stick out a couple of millimeters to minimize its effect on dragon stability. The data from this last camera is also live streamed down to ground station. And next up, there's Johannes from Recovery. Thank you, Anna. As mentioned earlier by Cecilia, the drug shoot is deployed by separating the couplers. But how on earth would one go about separating the couplers at Apogee? Well, one easy solution would have been to go with black powder. But here in Norway, black powder is prohibited. So instead, we opted to pressurize the rocket, or more precisely, pressurize the compartment housing the parachute system. This will be done using the Hawk system. The main function of the Hawk system is to puncture a CO2 cartridge. Inside the Hawk, there resides a loaded spring ready to be released by the servo during flight. The gas then flows through this hose into the recovery bay, which causes the shear screws to break, deploying the drog chute. With the drog chute out, the rocket obtains a terminal velocity of 25.6 meters per second. But this is only part of the recovery system. The other half is the main chute release system, which serves a unique challenge. The challenge being that the system has to be able to absorb the release of the drog chute while also being able to release the main chute electronically. Originally, we went about solving this by having a spring held in place by a release arm, much like the Hawk system. But this proved easier said than done, as tests showed that the system needed more space than available, thus requiring a redesign. And this is what we came up with. This is the main chute release system, or simply the NCRS. The system is made out of tough steel and consists of two plates bent 90 degrees with a release hook in between. The release hook is mechanically locked in place by the lower release arm. Due to the unusual shapes formed in the MCRS, laser cutting was the way to go with manufacturing. The MCRS is capable of being triggered by both the KUTS and the SRAT flight computer. When the system is triggered, the servo pushes the lower release arm out of the way causing the release hook to loosen, and the main chute is then deployed, even under a load. The main chute leads the rocket to hit the ground with a velocity of 6.2 meters a second. 
Now, over to our partner Frederick from Orbit and Tenu, which will present the payload. Hello, I'm from Orbit and we are a student organization who specializes in making satellites. And this year we are collaborating with Propulse in making the payload for the rocket Statin. This year uh, the payload will consist of a cylindrical payload which will conduct an experiment with frow fluid, which is essentially just uh, water mixed with iron. And when it is placed alongside a magnet, the magnet will induce some unique behavior in the fluid. We are interested to see how this fluid behaves under very high acceleration and vibrations and to see if this perhaps can be used in some instruments that require uh, fluids that will, can remain stable under high vibrations. And now, back to Hanna. Thank you, Frederick. I hope this video has been informative and engaging. I have to say, working on this project throughout the year has been amazing. It would not have been possible if it was not for our mentors, our sponsors, and last but not least, our incredibly skilled and driven members. Thank you.